Hi, everybody. My name is Ashlyn McKibben. I am your host today. This is the Little Art Studio podcast, and I just wanted to come on here and introduce you guys to Danny Reed. Hi, I'm Danny. We're in her beautiful home here in Miami, Florida, and I'm going to let her take it away and introduce herself a little bit and tell you guys about her. <laughs> All right. So my name is Danny Reed. I just moved back to Miami. I lived here about five, six years ago, um, and I am the owner of FYI Swimwear. Um, our website is FYIswim.com, and we just launched during Miami Swim Week. Um, it is a locally made, sustainable, inclusive swimwear line that I am really excited to talk to you about. Yeah. So I found you through mutual friend who goes by Disco Sexo, who's also going to be on the show. It might be out by the time this episode airs. All right. Um, but I've known her for years now. One of my first friends in Miami saw her modeling near swimwear, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever, seeing the sketches come to life, and I wanted to... And I get into the process and I, I guess like the start to finish on everything and how, how that is for you. Cool. Yeah. Disco Sexo was a great model. Um, yeah. My, my first campaign model that I hired when I moved back here. So yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, she's she, so tall. And <laughs> yeah. She really knows how to move in front of the camera. So all of those images are amazing. And she actually closed out our fashion show at Miami Swim Week too. So, um, and it, you know, it's really important to me to be using people from the community like mm -hmm. that, involving people from the community. Mm -hmm. um, all of my models are people who are kind of like muses to me. So yeah. they're all um, women and non-binary people who are like really a part of the community. Like mm -hmm. most of them are part of the community here in Miami, but in one way or another, they've been you know, supportive of me as a creative. And uh, it's, it's kind of an opportunity to reciprocate that mm -hmm. and, and make it something that the whole uh, uh, network is sort of involved in. Yeah, I was looking at kind of like the string of models that you had in that show because I was watching it while it was happening. And, you know, I have a lot of photography friends or video friends that'll work in, you know, the swim week realm. And I never really got into it. I felt like that the behind the camera people are all, almost always men. And it feels yep. like such a sausage fest to me that I never really got into that environment. So I saw you with like you being a woman designer and then having like all of these like femmes and queer people and as your models, I thought it was really cool because I feel like you always kind of see the standard really pretty kind of Miami girl yeah. as like the model and they all look identical identical and like I don't know how they do that but they I don't either to like really look identical and so I loved the variety of people that you had you're so right about it was that really neat um yeah that's something I noticed right away when I got accepted into swim week um the show that I was a part of actually offered to do all of model casting and so I I had like drop downs that I could choose from the different sizes and genders that I wanted to choose from and of course it only had men and women to choose mm -hmm. from. And then within women, there was a standard size, which was uh, zero to two and or no zero to four, I believe. And then a plus size, which was six to ten, a, a women's American size, six to ten, which is not plus size at yeah. all, um, like a medium to a large maybe, but not right. even an extra large. So I was really alarmed at like what they were presenting as body diversity. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do my own casting. That's um, super cool that you were able to do that. I'm so glad I did. I kind of insisted because when I saw what their, uh, what the kind of standard and ideal was for Miami Swim Week, I was yeah. kind of appalled. I was like, it's 2023. We need to mix it up a little bit more yeah. than this. And, you know, as not only as a woman designer, but as a queer designer, I was like, this has got to change at yeah. least uh, as the way I'm going to present it is going to look and feel a lot different. Um, so I'm really proud of that show. The lineup of models that I had was the most beautiful, most professional lineup of models I've ever had. And almost none of them are career models. Yeah. Um, so it was a really, really um, magical experience for everyone. And we definitely queered up Miami Swim Week. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's super cool. I mean, I don't feel like I saw anybody else doing that. I mean, I know that there's Chromat is a big one that kind of has like the same values too, but I don't know. I don't know their deal. I don't know if they were at Swim Week or what was going on with them this year. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I didn't see a presentation from them this year, but yeah, yeah you're right. That's another brand that shares a lot of similar values. Yeah. Um, and it's so important. Like, I don't really understand why more brands aren't embracing that because mm -hmm. why do you want 
people to think that your your audience and the wearer of your product is so narrow. Yeah. Um, Do you know the actual size of like the the average size of women in America? Like what the maybe the most purchased size is? You know what? That's a really good question. I've heard different things, so. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure informed enough to give yeah. you an answer. I would be curious. Um, we need to look it up. <laughs> I know it's I know it's bigger than six to ten. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so right. I mean that's again, that's definitely not plus size and not what I wanted to uh to put forward and represent as plus size. So yeah. um yeah, I, I I was really proud of like the the range of people that we had in the show, not just body diversity, but gender diversity and racial mm -hmm. diversity. And um, I think we showed uh, Miami Swim Week a little bit something different. Yeah. I don't know how people aren't bored by now, you know, yeah. like, especially because I, I don't know, I haven't been to Swim Week, but you have to sit through several designers at most shows. Oh, yeah. And if you're looking at the same... I feel like just the same person over and over and over. I feel like I am invested into like what the swimsuit looks like on multiple people or on multiple bodies. Like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to just see the same exact thing. Like that's one thing shopping on certain websites where I'm like, oh, well, damn, my body doesn't look like that. You know, oh, the, right. the model's wearing a small or whatever. I'm like, I don't have, I don't have boobs like that. Right. But, you know, like you need to see it on different body types to get an idea of what it's going to be like for you. Of course. Act but, I mean, as a woman, of course, you understand that. Like, um, you know, I think I, I'm also really careful to cast kind of in between sizes too, not just the standard air quote standard model size and not just like the standard air quote standard plus size. Mm -hmm. um, I, I cast a lot of people who are in between too, like curvy medium, size large, size extra large, because, you know, I, I do think that's kind of the range of the standard or, yeah. the, or the range of the average, I mean. Um, and I think it's important for people to see themselves represented. How can you relate to a product if you can't, uh, if it's not for you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's cool too, because you can like shop with your friends, you know, and I, I don't know. I think of things like that, where it's like, if all my friends have different body types and say we walk into a shop that's just generated for one body type, it's like, maybe one of us can shop here, but then like, right. not, you know, the rest of us can't, or, you know, it doesn't make sense. So I don't know. I love to see it. You did a great job with it. Thank you. I I'm really excited appreciate to see that. like what else you do in my, I mean, Miami is such a good place for swim and there's so many different kinds of people here that you're going to do great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up, um, you know, really loving swimwear. Um, I grew up on a lake and just lived in my swimsuit all the time. So it's yeah. something I've always really been passionate about. But I studied fashion design and then ended up in lingerie. And I have been in the lingerie industry for like 15 years. Mm. Um, FYI was actually launched as a luxury lingerie brand in 2011 okay. during Brooklyn Fashion Week. Um, and it just took off immediately. Like mm. I did a small fashion show. Um and Book Confession Week was still really new. It was at this place called Glasslands, which was like, I don't know if they're still around, but very, very DIY space. Like mm -hmm. they were serving beer out of a cooler. Def definitely wasn't a licensed place. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a really cool show. And I, you know, I did it with other designers and the collection just took off. I, I got picked up by like 25 stores in five countries. And before I knew it, I was running a full blown business. That's amazing. Um, so I've been doing laundry since then. And that brand was kind of my... Uh, but my springboard to lead to a lot of other things in my career. Mm -hmm. um, so the last five years I've been, the reason I've been away from Miami, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, was because I was the design director at Savage X Fenty. So I was a leading lingerie design there. Um, and I started working there before the brand even had a name. I had yeah. to move and tell my friends that I had to move for this top secret job. And I was going to say, like, was it confidential? It was what totally confidential. To talk about? <laughs> I had signed the craziest NDAs because I was working directly with Rihanna. So I couldn't talk about anything at all. And of course, I was very, you know, excited to have this opportunity. I didn't want to jeopardize that. So kept my lips sealed. And my friends were like, what are you designing lingerie for the CIA or something? Yeah. Like, how Basically. could you possibly have a top secret lingerie design job? Um, but I did. I was like, trust me, in like six months, it'll all make sense. Yeah. And, uh, and then the brand launched. And then I believe like another six months after that, we had our first really big fashion show. So I think my friends were able to appreciate like why I had to make that choice. Yeah. Um, 
but it was tough being away from Miami and also working a corporate job and yeah. working for a celebrity where you had to kind of travel all over the place. But I learned so much there that I'm able to apply to this now. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm finally ready to make swimwear the way that I want to make swimwear, which is sustainably and um and making things that are really versatile, everything's reversible, mm -hmm. um, and making things that are really body inclusive. You know, I, I've been working on all body shapes at Savage for the last five years, so I've gotten really good at fit solutions um, that's for, amazing. To, that, that kind of adapt to everyone. So yeah. that's what I think I'm kind of bringing to the table when it comes to a swimwear line that, you know, it stands out from what else is out there. We have a really unique sizing system because, you know, everyone hates shopping for swimwear. It's really mm -hmm. hard to know what size you're going to be. It's super hard. Yeah. And Not sometimes it's like the top is different than the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the story of my life. <laughs> so I have, like I said, kind of engineered the pieces to be really fit flexible mm -hmm. because they're reversible. They're two layers and that creates a lot of elasticity and a lot of support. So we're able to, I've able been able to develop sizes that are um, like a range. So like a size one is extra small through medium. A size two is large through 1x and a size 3 is 2x through 4x so mm -hmm. we can go all the way from extra small to 4x in only three sizes cool. so it's a it's a little one two three system it's really really easy yeah and it almost kind of depends on your preference of coverage too so like you know i'll shoot one swimsuit on a curvy size medium girl and then the same model in both a size one and a size two to show that you know, you can wear both sizes. Oh, yeah. This really depends on how much coverage you want. If you want a super, super micro look, which is something we really push at FYI. Well, that's like, that is a Miami thing. Exactly. Like when I visit my grandma, she's like, your whole ass is out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, my ass is going to get tan. Right. Like, I need to yeah, I don't want ass. a tan line on it, grandma. Yeah. <laughs> like, she get with the times. She's like, well, nobody up here dresses like that. <laughs> like she's very like old school about this yeah you're like well that's florida but we're in miami yeah so. <laughs> yeah um one of my favorite products in the collection is the i call it the convertible micro bikini because the idea is that you have a a bikini with you all the time it comes yeah. on a little matching drawstring bag it's really small so you can kind of stash it anywhere you can keep it in your purse or your backpack yeah. or your car um because if you're a miami girl you never know when you're gonna need a bikini so i yeah i literally um was one of my friends came from another state and i was like well let's just go to the beach after you get out of work and she's like well i have to go home and get my swimsuit i'm like you don't have a swimsuit in your car like yeah. you haven't figured that out yet that you, need a swimsuit you don't have in the your glove box bikini yet <laughs> Well, I she like needs the, a convertible micro kini. That's a good. That's a good name. The glove box bikini. <laughs> glove the glove box kini. We keep them around. <laughs> keep that thing on us. Um, I kind of want to go back to you working for Savage for a little bit, um, because that's major, first of all, and your role there is major. You should be very proud of yourself for that. Thank you. Um, I am curious to know what was the most valuable thing that you think you learned there, because you were there five years. Yeah, five years. It's a hot minute. And that brand yeah. went through a lot oh during my gosh. that time. Yeah, so it much. skyrocketed during that time. Yeah, it turned into, it was valued at $3 billion by Forbes at one wow. point. Wow. Which is, you know, I don't know how real that is. But there are, yeah. But uh, it's that was the published valuation. So yeah. we really built a big thing there. Yeah, um, and major. yeah, I'm, I am really proud of what I did there. And I, I led an amazing team of incredibly talented designers. So I designed all kinds of products there, but I was by no means the only one. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was it was a, a an awesome collaborative team effort. And many, many places that I've worked, I've worked alone or, um, you know, lingerie is a really small industry. Most of the companies are really small. So. Mm -hmm. I've either worked alone or with teams of like five people or less. And I think one of the things that I learned the most at Savage was like, first of all, navigating a corporate environment was tough for me. I'm a, I'm a punk rocker. I'm a musician and an artist. And that was like, and I've been freelancing and working for myself for most of my life. So that was tough to adjust to. Um, and I, but I think that like learning to be really creative and collaborative with a team mm -hmm. was one of the best things that I got out of that experience um, because I worked with so many awesome artists and and younger artists that I had the privilege of like mentoring into mm -hmm. like really badass designers. So yeah. um, that was one of the most valuable things I learned. 
Um, and of course, you know, fitting on all bodies too. I, I, I started their first, um, I designed their first pride camp, pride capsule, which, you know, yeah. as a queer person, I'm Aww. very, very proud of. Um, and we, uh, you know, talked a lot about, we met with glad we, we really wanted to make sure we were approaching it correctly and including everyone. And, um, during that development process, we made sure that we were creating products that we couldn't, wouldn't just market as all gender, but that really were. Yeah. So we would, um, work with fit models that did, had gender, different, different gender presentations and, um, all different body types. And so that was like a really unique experience you know, to work with a company that had the budget to like yeah. hire a bunch of different kinds of models to make sure we were being like truly, truly inclusive. And like from a technical aspect was right. like such an awesome experience. Yeah. And that's that's a huge thing right now for brands. I think people are finally criticizing brands for just slapping rainbows onto it and right. calling it a pride collection. Right. So when you actually do the background work and figure out, OK, what do people who present as this or present as that and with different kinds of bodies and different kinds of identities like how do we wrap this up properly to actually can like be conducive to these people versus yeah okay this is the this is the gay collection of the year everybody, exactly you know? <laughs> exactly and as a queer design director we were not gonna rainbow wash no. on my watch and actually you know to her credit rihanna really cares about stuff like that yeah. she doesn't want to do things like that it either. seemed like that was really a mission of hers from the get which was really cool because at the same time i think it was literally the same time that she was launching savage was when victoria's secret came out and basically said oh no we're not going to change our model structure and we you know they decided to not be inclusive about anything and they stood by that in a public statement which yeah. i think is kind of crazy that you can just acknowledge that all these people exist, but then be like, I'm not going to cater to them. Like that's technically it's more money in your pocket. The more people you cater cater to as a company. So I don't know why. It was so dumb. And you see what they're doing now. I mean, they're, they're doing the fashion show. I think this year that is mm -hmm. really like a, copying the blueprint of the Savage Fashion oh, Show. Oh, really? Like, identical. I thought that the Savage Fashion Show, when they first did it, I was like, this is incredible. Like, as it somebody was. super into video and, you know, like, all of those element elements, I think it's so fucking amazing what they're doing. So... It's an incredible. They can huge try production. to copy it, but they're not going to be able to do it anything like that. Good <laughs> luck, Vicky. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but oh yeah, when that stuff came out, you know, we were just getting started with Savage, so we were popping bottles. The, yeah, the office was just plastered in uh, newspaper clippings of Victoria's Secret. Yeah. Rest in peace. Like no, like literally let them die on that hill. Yeah, is how we I were feel like about okay, people like that. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you oh. can't you can't sit with us. <laughs> yeah, no, no. There's a, a little bit of a hurricane situation yeah, happening outside. Up. I forgot there was a hurricane <laughs> today. Yeah. There's a hurricane, a full moon. <laughs> More Miami things. We just aren't even faced by it. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, no, no. But I, I, I really like to see what you're doing. I think it's great that you had all of that um, kind of corporate training. It's funny to hear you say that you went from freelancing into corporate and now you're back to freelancing yeah. again. Yeah. And I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. I, um, you That's know, I'm really grateful saying. for that experience, but I don't want to do it again. It yeah. was hard. It was really hard in a lot of ways. Uh, I think emotionally it was really challenging for me. Um, it was kind of isolating because even though we had a big team, just like, you know, corporate is so serious and mm -hmm. people can't be very authentic. And mm -hmm. that was tough for me. So um, FYI, you know, is truly a reflection of m myself. So it's kind of like, like I've taken the training wheels off. Like yeah, I'm yeah. ready to go now. This is like really my passion project. And I'm, I feel personally like I'm doing some of my best work. So I'm so excited to take what I've learned in that really structured environment and, you know, be free with, uh, with, a, with a company that has an enormous budget and yeah. then now be able to like implement those those learnings um, on my own product that I really, really care about. And I and do it sustainably because... Yeah, was, that was my next topic. I wanted to yeah. get into the sustainability aspect of what yeah. you're doing. Tell us a little bit about that. I will. <laughs> I will because, you know, these big companies, that's another thing about working for a big company. At the end of the day, it's a fast fashion company. And while that gave me an, a lot of opportunities to create, yeah. um, I am also hyper aware that that was also, um, you know, that business model... A, uh, a subscription business model where you have to constantly provide something new. It's it's exciting as a designer, but it's so bad for the environment. Yeah, it's so bad for the people and the economy. I just I you know it really 
bums me out. Like the, the subscription thing is interesting to me because it's it's so excessive, you know? Right. Like, I feel like I've been wearing the same bikini for three or four years. You, you know don't need like, a new one every $50 doing, worth of laundry yeah, every month. they're doing this every single month. Well, yeah, I guess they do more than just swim, swim. I don't know. Yeah, more laundry. They don't even do swim. Oh, they don't? Oh, no, okay. not at all. Oh, yeah. Well, fuck. I was thinking this whole time they did swim. No. They had, like, they, a swim line, they've too. Got, they've oh, got, yeah, like, athletic wear all. now. Oh, but, maybe that's what yeah. I was thinking of was the athletic stuff. They've definitely gone in that direction, but they but don't have But it's all of it. That's the subscription model, right? Like everything. Everything. Yeah. I think you can shop it without, but the prices are much higher and they make sure you know that. But you right. only get the deals if you get the yeah. subscription. Um, and it's not just the subscription model, but it's just fast fashion in general. Like, I, you know, I worked private label before. So and when I lived here in Miami before I did lingerie for companies like mm -hmm. Forever 21 and Fashion Nova and Yandy and like, mm -hmm. again, lots of opportunity to create. My portfolio was fat, but yeah. um, I don't feel good about the uh, environment in, in which those garments are produced and mm -hmm. the volume at which they're produced and the speed at which they're produced. So um, my company, where I have control over those decisions, has always been uh, slow fashion and locally produced. I yeah. feel really, you know, the sustainable element so much of so many things in our lives are so wasteful and and nothing lasts forever and i i definitely work hard to make sure there's a sustainable element in our brand and i'll talk about that in a second yeah but my number one priority is really the human human rights aspect of it i i think a lot of horrible things happen um in garment production i'm sure you've seen articles about it mm -hmm. but when people shop at shein and um and Fashion Nova on Forever 21, like no shade. Like I said, I've designed for places like that. But um, if, if you're paying $5 for a tank top, somebody didn't get paid to right. make that. Right, right, Everything right. is handmade. Like mm -hmm. there's no machine that makes an entire garment, unless we're talking about hosiery and getting really technical. But like really a person is making everything that you're, make, you're wearing. So you got to think about like the moral compromise you're making when you buy that four dollar tank top. That's that's a big thing in my industry too. Like a lot of videographers will send video work out, you know, and they're like, "Oh, well, like my editor's in like India or my editor is here," and like it's always like overseas, and they're like, "Just just outsource your editing and get it super cheap overseas." And I'm like, "I I can't feel good about doing that, you know. I'm not gonna right. pay some guy twenty bucks to edit a wedding video, no. you know. Like I am all for like." outsourcing and everything like that. But I do want to make sure that I am paying somebody. That with you're their, not exploiting you know, like, people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, like, like I mean, we all got to make a profit. Especially but it, if I'm if I'm making money on a wedding and I'm making like good money on a wedding, I'm not going to just be like, oh, yeah, this guy can edit it for 20 bucks or 50 bucks. And it's a 20 minute long video that's going to take him a week or two weeks to do. Like, no way. That's because you have a conscience. Yeah. So lots of people <laughs> yeah. don't or they're willing to kind of ignore that for the prices and you know it's just it is something I like to remind people about because it's something I've always been really aware of when I work in the garment industry and like you know I, I like to have even when I work for big companies I like to have very close relationships with my with my factories and travel there frequently so that I feel good about the kinds of people I'm doing business with because I can't sleep at night if I feel like someone's being exploited yeah um but you know I know full well that that some mm -hmm. of the companies that I've designed for do, you know, very questionable things for cheap production. And so, and they may not even be aware of it. A lot of garment production is like outsourced and then outsourced and then outsourced. And right. so like the company may not even have any uh, direct knowledge of uh, so human hands. rights violations that yeah. are happening. But that's the number one reason that I prioritize local production. I mean, this, the, the side uh, benefits are like, you know, there's a way smaller carbon footprint. We're not shipping things around. Um, all the materials are purchased here too. So we're not like, I'm not shipping things. I'm not, uh, we're not dying materials. Um, and everything's being done, you know, in the community. The yeah. factory that I work with is a really great, like family owned business that was started, I don't know, maybe like eight or nine years ago by the woman who runs it. Um, a young Latin family who does an incredible job and at creating like a really worker friendly environment. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always music playing and it's like painted hot pink and they've Cute. got a little showroom in the front. And, um, 
one of the sewers brings her cat and they've always got music blaring. And I just really, it's a great environment. I go yeah. there all the time and it's something that I can feel good about. Well, yeah, they're so important to your business and they're, you know, they're part of it for you. And to me, it's like when you are your own business, I think it's so important that everybody that you're working with kind of feels like, I don't want to say like feels like family, but in a way it's, you Absolutely. need to make sure everybody is on the same page. Everybody is like kind of the same energy, the same vibe that they're bringing to it. And I don't know. I think also too making garments, I have started thinking recently, it's kind of like braiding your hair. Like when you braid somebody's hair, you're kind of transferring like their energy to you and stuff yes. like that or vice versa. And I feel like that's almost the same thing. It, it's kind of bad intentions behind it that can also, that energy can transfer. Right. Nobody wants that. Like stealing <laughs> crystals. Not yeah. good. Don't yeah. do it. Don't touch Don't buy the $4 crystals. tank tops. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's being exploited along the lines. But yeah, that's, um, you know, it, working with people in the community is is so important to me for so many reasons. One, because I love Miami so much mm -hmm. um, and I genuinely care about this community. Um, and two, like you said, it's important to create that like family environment where everyone's succeeding. I, um, you know, this is another lesson that I learned from my last job is even though I was the design, like, like you know, lead designer there for five years. Never, ever once did I attend a fashion show or anyone on my team. Damn. Never once did. And we met with Rihanna frequently, like, to do business, to do design work. But never, ever will be included in anything when yeah. the product came out. It's like they forgot that we made it. And so um, I know what that feels like. Yeah. And I know what it feels like to see people who worked really hard, like my you know, assistant designer who designed a custom piece for a celebrity and then didn't get to go to the performance. Like I see what that does to people's morale. Mm -hmm. And I promised myself I would never do that with my company. So with swim week, you know, I think they gave me five guest passes. Mm -hmm. Um, I bought, I fought for a few more, but I insisted that the, the guy who sold me my fabric was at the show yeah, that the, so the cool. both both of the owners and the pattern maker from my factory were there. Yeah. They sat in the front row. Like I didn't care about making sure that, you know, so and so's friend who works at so whatever magazine was there. Mm -hmm. Like the people who worked on that stuff deserve to be there because I know what it feels like to be like left out, to yeah. do all the work and then be well, forgotten. That creates an incentive later too to like keep going and to keep, you know, like to keep that production level as high as it is. It keeps it as an incentive later. Like you get to see your work like at the end of the day on a runway. And that's, I don't know. I think that's a really good way of doing it because people are so concerned about the influencing aspect. I feel like at Swim Week, it's uh -huh. always influencers and it's just what parties, what events can we get into because we're this level of this. And it's always, yes. it's, you know, and influencing in its own right is kind of its own art form because that's, that's a whole other Definitely. conversation. But I think it, yeah, the people who are behind it matter. Big time. More. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, like you said, it, it creates a better product because they're invested in it now. Mm. They care. They feel cared about and celebrated and, you know, not just like they don't have to just be the faceless pattern maker. Like I'm introducing her to people. This is the person who patterned my stuff and made sure that it fits as amazing as I wanted it to mm -hmm. fit. Um, so those people are important to me and I want to celebrate them like, you know, at every at every stage, just like my models. of You know, all, these are people who inspire me that make this possible. It's my this brand is my vision, but it could not come to life, you know, Fashion's like making a movie. Like it, yeah. I'm just the director. Like every, there have to be so many other players involved. Mm -hmm. I can't make it alone. Yeah. So I want to, um, even though my name's on it, I want to constantly be putting the spotlight back on the people who are really helping me create this because I don't do it in a vacuum. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, it's fascinating. The, um, the background of everything. Like I, I just shot a music festival in Atlanta and my goal was to shoot the people in production. So it's like shooting the lighting tech, shooting, like I told you the girl that did the live video feed for the killers, she's gonna be on this show, but it's like, I connected with her, I connected with the other photographers that are on tour with the bands and photograph them. You know, it's like the the people who are responsible for creating that massive image that you see, that big hero shot at the end of the day of the artist on stage, like how many hundreds and hundreds of people are behind them? Right. So I think the background, the behind the scenes people are sometimes way more interesting than, you know, the influencers that parade around in it on, yeah. <laughs> on Instagram. You so. said it. And honestly, working for celebrities, too, it's yeah. like that. It's like the characters creating this image are are 
many. Yeah. You know, there's so many. It's really varied. Some are really toxic and some yeah. are really amazing. Do you have an idea of how many designers were on at the same time as you? On my team? Yeah. Yeah. I usually led a team of about six designers. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow. it's, I think it's probably grown since then because since uh, they had started doing men's before I left, but they mm -hmm. just had started doing the sports stuff when I left. And I know they've hired some designers that are specific to that too. So it's probably bigger than that now. Um, I love the men's club. But yeah, I know me too. I wear a lot of it. Like, I, I, that's like, that's the line that I would probably buy. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's, I'm so curious about that too, trying to make a cohesive collection with six other minds on something because everything needs to be, look like, everything needs to look like one brand and right. one design, but there's, you know, six different creative minds working on one product. That's also a lot to unpack. I don't know. It is. I guess I get I guess the approval process has to be insane. It is or something. I like mean that. yeah, that's why I said that was probably one of the biggest lessons I learned there because it was tough. And you know, half of the time I was there, we were doing it fully remotely too, because oh, like we COVID were just COVID and we were in California and they were really serious about it. And we were locked down for like two and a half years. We didn't go into the office. Mm -hmm. So that's I worked there for five years. So literally half the time I was there, we weren't even present together. So and we we made it work, man. I we got so good at doing virtual fittings. Um, I wanted to keep it that way because the models were so comfortable in their own homes. They right. were having like their partners like zip them up or lace them in. Aww. They were like just really relaxed. And they, I was getting really good feedback from them because they were like, you know, they could sit on their couch and be like, oh, it's like poking me here. Or like, oh, I wouldn't really wear this around the house because it's like riding up. And I was getting very authentic feedback because they were in like an environment where they were really comfortable. Um, and, and, you know, we had, we zoom and really really good cameras and we and all the light we sent them lighting setups and everything so that cool. we could see things we actually was surprisingly smooth as well mm -hmm. but um we, I would do things with the team, like uh, do an inspiration trip at the beginning. We didn't have a big budget for that, so it's not like we got to travel, travel. But yeah. like, for instance, um, one season we were we knew we wanted to do a collection that was really inspired by like cars and racing, and so I took them to the Peterson Auto Museum in LA, which is amazing, and I got like these super VIP passes where they took us to like the archives, which is oh, basically yeah. just like a giant parking garage filled with like multi-million dollar cars. Yeah. Um, and it was really cool. We got like a whole tour of like just California lowriders and like just the cars from James Bond Love and then just that. like, so we had a really, really amazing experience where not only were we out of the office bonding, doing something fun, um, but we were also all looking at the same inspiration mm -hmm. so that when we put the pencil to paper, we had all kind of seen the same, our minds had been ah, in the same places, okay. you know? That's cool. Um, yeah. So I did a lot of things like that to try to get us like On the same warmed page. up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I used collaborative software. Like I mentioned Miro earlier before we were uh, recording. Um, it's a cloud-based like collaborative software that I am swearing by now. Yeah. I use it for everything. And it was really great because you can see like everyone's mouse moving around. You can drop in tons of images. So I could really see where my designer's inspiration was coming from and help re-guide them if it wasn't if it wasn't in line with the brand or wasn't in line with what we had in mind before they got too far down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You know, I could be like, okay, this is really cool, but it's feeling kind of vaporwave and we wanted this to feel a little more 70s. So like mm -hmm. let's maybe let's maybe lean more in this direction. You know, I think it gave us a good opportunity to like uh really have like develop a visual language together mm -hmm. um if that makes any yeah, sense yeah no it totally does <laughs> um you know because designers kind of talk with images we're like it's like this but combined with this but then in these kind of colors and you know it's like a it's like a mental collage that you're making together of course, um yeah. so i feel like we would kind of establish that mental collage together before we actually started drawing so that by the time we were drawing it was really just a matter of making choices like mm -hmm. what was going to work the best for the brand right what do you feel like your current collection was inspired by? If you had like a prompt or something that oh, you could really. I, I could in. easily tell you that because I'm probably my favorite part about designing is concept work. That yeah. is my favorite, favorite part. Um, so I'm really, I started learning Italian like two years ago. 
And um, I'm really, really into old movies and especially into giallo films and commedial italiana films. So like the kind of mid-century Italian films from like the 50s to the yeah. late 70s, that is my jam. I'm like an expert on them now. So as, <laughs> as I've been learning Italian, I watch them over and over again because it helps me learn it. Mm -hmm. I love the visuals. I love that kind of music. Um, and so, you know, naturally that has kind of seeped into my psyche and my FYI relaunch collection was a hundred percent inspired by like mid-century maximalism and like the really intense vibrant colors of like 60s and 70s Italian movies yeah and I wanted it to have the same sort of like drama but humor you know uh -huh. kind of like uh like, like the American well. version of that is like Indora from Bewitched yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. She's like, she's like a sexy older lady who dresses really wild, but it's also very, very sophisticated. Um, and that's kind of how I wanted it to feel like a fancy Italian lady goes on vacation and like, what's she packing? Oh my God. You I can know? totally see that. So, Especially with like the cover ups. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I told the models that too, that when they went down the runway, I was like, okay, you're like, cause they were kind of struggling with like, how am I taking off the caftan or the robe to show off the bikini? Like at what point, how do I slip it off? And I was like, Act like you are just strutting down to the pool and you just caught the eye of like the hottest pool boy or the cutest bartender girl. Yeah. And you are, you know, they're watching you and you are working it. And you take that cover off, off all slow into your teeny bikini and slip into the pool. And that's what this runway walk should look like. Yeah. And every single one of them absolutely nailed it. But that's what I wanted it to feel like this sort of indulgent, uh, excessive. Mm -hmm. like European woman. Um, as I've been learning Italian, that you know, the uh woman, the word for woman is La Donna. And so I'm and my grandmother's name was Donna. So I'm always like, as I get older, I want to be like La Donna. I want to be like yeah. the woman, you know, like those sexy older Italian ladies that are just like so sophisticated you can't stand it. Right. Um in, in Italy, they call it scura. It's like a, there's a word for that particular kind of older woman. Um, yeah. And I've gotten super into that aesthetic. And so that was very much my inspiration because inclusion to me is more than just like, you know, the body and gender and uh, racial diversity that we talked about before. But it's also age diversity because yeah. I found that a lot of women feel that they can't wear something because they're older, mm -hmm. either because it's too skimpy or it's too bright or it's too loud. And I'm like, no, that's when you should be wearing this stuff. Yeah. So I want it. It was really actually kind of inspired by an older woman. And I want, you know, I want that to speak to my customer. Yeah. Yeah, I hate the fact that women feel like they have an expiration date on feeling sexy when, you know, it's not the case. No. I don't know. My one of my mentors, she was one of the first episodes on here and she's she's an older woman and um she talks all the time about that and she's like, "No, if I if I want to fuck, I'm going to fuck." You know, <laughs> like and I'm like, "Yes, girl." Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Cuz people feel like, "Yeah, you should stop having sex or stop drinking or stop dressing sexy." And, right. I don't know can't do all that no you absolutely cannot and you shouldn't and um yeah I love, I, I love that inspiration yeah so like and you know I'm getting older now so that's another thing like I'm that's my way of kind of combating that like social fear of aging like I'm living my best life right now I'm ha way happier than I was in my 20s so um don't be afraid of aging. I'm I'm just getting better. I think I look look better. I'm smarter. I've learned so yeah. much. Like I want women, including myself, to embrace that experience. And part of that for me is this like creating this sort of this way to like almost look forward to yeah. becoming something someone more mature yeah whenever <laughs> I see older ladies with their hair like completely gray I always compliment them on it and they get like shocked that I'm complimenting them on it and I'm like no like I started getting gray hair when I was like 13 wow so I know my hair will go all the way gray and everybody in my family they they go pretty pretty white really fast you know so by the time they're in their 50s or once they hit 60 really they're completely white and so glamorous though. i'm excited yeah, i like i, I love it and i think it's so beautiful and i think it looks very wise and they're like oh but it looks it looks old i'm like who cares who 
cares? Like if you're getting older, like embrace everything that your body does, like, right. you know, comes with it. So I don't know. I think it's really beautiful things like that. So, and I think aging is so beautiful too. Like if you see those like black and white photographs of, you know, your grandparents and older people, I think like the wrinkles and everything, it's just beautiful. It's something that should be embraced yeah. instead of being terrified of it. Absolutely. <laughs> And yeah, especially like as queer people, like unfortunately we don't get to see a lot of queer elders. When I do, I'm like, can I be your best friend? Like yeah, we're like yeah. like little puppies for queer elders. My wife and I both like I just, um, you know, it's like I want to absorb all of their wisdom and experiences, mm -hmm. and you know, I hope to be that for young the queer youngins. And and you know, I can't be that unless I'm willing to become that. I don't think there's anything to be afraid of when it comes to aging. And my collection actually was really inspired by that, like living loudly with, and, and regardless of, of your age. Yeah. Do you think your next collection, are you going to change like the themes as you go on or what do you think your plan will be? For Absolutely. That? My inspiration is evolving all the time. It's mm -hmm. I already have like a capsule collection. I'm thinking about for Basil, like a little holiday thing I'm going to do. That's like a little mini tropical holiday. So I'm always coming up with a new concept because that is my favorite part, but th there will definitely always be a consistent identity of the brand. Mm -hmm. You know, I also really like building a brand. That's like what I've done for most of my career mm -hmm. um so really like I think the brand has really this this collection has really set the tone for the brand's identity but it's definitely going to look different every season cool that's awesome and you plan on doing two collections a year is that your goal or well actually I might only do one a year I'm still kind of feeling that out um I mentioned before that FYI is a sustainable brand in more ways than just being local. And one of those ways is that um, everything so far, and I hope to keep it this way, everything is produced from dead stock um, designer materials. So mm -hmm. I work with um, fabric suppliers that get fabrics from luxury houses and, and mills that make fabric for luxury houses after they've released their dead stock. So these are fabrics that would... Um, that are from past collections that would normally end up in a landfill. Um, so for instance, I have the spandex from a Balenciaga 2020 collection and silk from a Pucci 2017 collection. And a lot of times people will be browsing my things and say, oh my gosh, this looks kind of like a Pucci fabric. I'm like, well, it is. It's yeah. been upcycled into something. I new. didn't even know that that's an option for people to buy stuff like that. Well, when you are, what I've, one of the many things I've learned working for like a big brand is that when you're producing um, thousands or even just hundreds of units of something at a time, you have to meet minimums on every single component for that item. So, you know, even if Pucci is only going to make like uh, 600 of a blouse, they are developing their own print and they probably have to buy anywhere from five to 10,000 yards of that fabric right. because they, they have a minimum to meet with the fab, with the, with the place that makes the fabric and with the place that prints the fabric, if they're two different ones. And so they end up with a lot more fabric than they need. And they don't want to make more product than they need because that devalues their business. You know, if it's too easy to buy, you know, if it's they make 2000 of something, anyone can have it. But right. if they make 800, they can charge a lot of money. Yeah, for it. it removes the exclusivity out of right. it. Right. So designer houses end up with lots and lots of dead stock because they have to buy huge quantities to make something that they may only make a few of. So um, you'd be surprised how much, uh, how many recognizable prints end up just mm -hmm. basically like bound for the garbage or in storage until they're not usable anymore because a lot of fibers break down, especially spandex fibers. Mm. Um, so they have an expiration date. So those things have to be used up. And so I've been really fortunate to, you know, find dealers here in Miami who work in, in, in fabrics like that. Wow. And so, the, yes, the collections will always look different because we're really limited. When we do a run of something, like, when that's it's gone, it. it's one, gone. Yeah, one and done, I can't do... Um, I can't do like second drops of the exact same item. I can make the exact same swimsuit in a new color or a new print, but um, you're always going to get something fresh from FYI. Cool. That's, yeah, that's really crazy. I don't know why, well, I guess maybe the, the limitations of it. I was going to say, I don't know why more fast fashion brands don't lean into doing stuff like that, but... I don't either, but you know what? It it probably has a lot to do with the with the availability. Like I said, when I run, I'm producing really small quantities. So, mm -hmm. and they're being produced locally. So when I run out of fabric, I run out of fabric. Mm -hmm. And like 
you know, a business like Forever 21 can't afford to do that. They need to know that they're going to have 500 units at each store on the first of the month. Mm -hmm. So they have to know they have an unlimited supply of fabric. Um, and, you know, they couldn't just buy from dead stock where it's like, okay, you may only get 60 yards and then that's it. You can't ever have more. That wouldn't be enough for them to make anything. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that. I also think there's probably intellectual property um, issues with companies that are really big and competitive. Part of the reason that I can do this is because I'm making a completely different product. Right. If I was making shirts and they were making shirts, that would be an issue because I would be bikinis. I right. I would be competing <laughs> with them, but I'm not. I'm making a completely different product from something that they've already thrown away. Got it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. There's so much to it. Yeah. It's a bummer when I run out of one that I love too, because it's, Oh yeah. Can't make it again. And I can't just, you know, I can't just reprint it. Um, not only would that probably be an intellectual property like violation, mm. but also, um, part of the reason that I'm buying the fabrics like this is because it costs, like I, like I mentioned, there's huge uh, minimums. So mm -hmm. I don't want to have a bunch of wastage. I don't want to be doing the same thing that those big companies are doing, not only because it's a huge waste of money for a small brand, but it's, you know, really bad for the environment. I don't mm -hmm. want to waste things. Is everything like e-commerce and word of mouth for you or are you in storefronts, like in locations? It will be e-com primarily. I'm still building the site. So right now we just launched during Miami Swim Week. So I really only had this company like relaunched for like, like six ten weeks. Minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's just a baby. Um, but we, I've done three or four really cool pop-ups in Miami in, in cool. uh, July and yeah. August. I did one at the Standard. I did one at um, the Miami Pool House, which is the Soho House's new property yeah. in Wynwood. That was a really cool space. I did one at a place called Casa Florida that was so cute. Oh, I've been uh, there. I love that place. Definitely fit that like that's 50s, that little, 60s vibe. That's like the little bar with the Airstream in the back, Yes. Right? Yeah. And it was a Barbie theme lesbian party. So like cute. how perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I've been doing some really cool pop-up events and just kind of connecting with the local community and selling, you know, locally, word of mouth, through Instagram. Mm -hmm. But we are building an e-commerce site and we will be up sometime during September. Um, but part of the reason that we haven't launched the site yet is because things are still being produced. So I don't yeah. have stock right now. I'm taking pre-orders for September and October. Um, and I, you know, I'm pretty sure when people are shopping e-com, they're going to want something when they order it. Yeah. So I'm waiting till I have the product ready to go. And, you know, slow fashion can be a little slow, especially when you're doing business in Miami. Yeah. People are on their own time. Are on, yeah. I don't think people understand Miami time. <laughs> it's island time, baby. If you show up on time, you're early here. <laughs> We like showed I, up. I texted you earlier. I was like, I need a few extra human minutes today. Yeah, that's perfectly normal. We but I was only 10 minutes late. So you that's know. not really late. That's, that's not, normal. Yeah, that's not late in Miami. <laughs> but my wife and I showed up like perfectly on time for a pool party the other day. And they were like, whoa, you're so early. Who's the prompt one? Like, <laughs> we were like an hour there, like an hour earlier than everyone else. Yeah. Miami. Yeah, I, I'm hosting a workshop soon and we're like, should we put the start time like 45 minutes early just so Probably. we can actually start at the right time? Because, yeah, no, I can't imagine. Well, yeah, production in general is tough. Here yeah, it's thing. tough anyway. But um, I've done local production in New York and it wasn't really like this. Um, yeah. It was, you know, let's move a little bit quicker there. People yeah. act with a little more urgency. But, you know, it's a nice lifestyle down here. and. Our, uh, our whole catchphrase with FYI is forever vacation. We want to bring you forever vacation for everybody. So, um, you know, I can't be mad when my partners want to have forever vacation too. Yeah. That's <laughs> I know. I remember go when I went to New York for the first time, I was like, oh my God, everybody walks so fast here. <laughs> like, I feel like I was running yeah. you know, down the street. Well, yeah. And then my wife and I are both Amazons with like nine foot legs. So we <laughs> walk like way too fast for anyone here in Miami. It's funny. <laughs> We started just like, so sometimes when I go to dinner here, we'll just ask for the check like right after we order our food oh, yeah. because otherwise yeah, yeah, yeah. you You'll have to there sit for there hours. for like two hours yeah. waiting for the check. And it, it's just a Miami thing. You're like, if I don't ask for it right now, I'm never going to see this waiter ever again. Well, when they, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. No. And when they come, they're like, oh, do you guys want any drinks? I'm like, I'm ready to order. Yeah. <laughs> so I know how long this is You're like, take. I want this and this yeah, and this yeah. and this and check. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll just go ahead and bring it all. Yeah. 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 People don't don't realize Miami. They're like, oh, well, you know, we have dinner reservations. I'm like, it doesn't matter what time you have the dinner reservations. Oh, no, you you're still going to wait an hour. Yeah, yeah. Even if you had the reservation. I have lots of friends. Like the, the girls who came in town for the 
for swim week. Mm -hmm. A lot of my models went to the Versace mansion for dinner and we were like, okay, it's an experience, go do it, but just know. So you're gonna be there for four hours. It's not a culinary <laughs> one. And it's <laughs> also like, they're like, oh no, we have a, we said you were gonna have to wait a long time. And they're like, no, 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 we have a reservation. I was like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So does everybody else. Yep. <laughs> so like, yep. And sure enough, they waited like 45 minutes, I think, after their reservation oh, to sit man. down. They had a great time though. And they said the food was actually really good. So I can't, can't, uh, bag on Gianni's too much. I've actually, I've not been yet since I've lived here. I haven't since I moved back, but hope to go, you know, just, it's like the novelty of it. You gotta, yeah. you gotta go once in a while, especially with like somebody, a tourist, you know, right. it's like doing the touristy stuff. Yeah. You know where I haven't been yet that I really want to go is Vizcaya. Oh, I shoot there all the time. I tried to go one time and it was like a Tuesday and they're closed on Tuesdays. Yeah. I learned the hard way. And oh. ever since my wife, Get there it's beautiful it looks so beautiful yeah i shoot there all the time that's a really big thing for um engagements oh, and I wedding bet. portraits and quinceanera portraits and i bet all those things so i'm kind of desensitized to this guy because yeah, like, i'm gotta like go whenever. it probably costs a fortune to shoot there it's really expensive i think wow. that they kind of try to discourage people from shooting there so often so they make it really expensive yeah but another one is the biltmore like just to have a two-hour photo pass i think it's like 800 dollars insane wow i could really see your actually i could really see your stuff being shot at this guy that would be really dope yeah i know i i mean that's the dream right but yeah i don't know if we got the bread for that we're yet. gonna manifest one the day bread. we're gonna one manifest day. the bread i'm manifesting this. a lot of things right now i'm gonna i'm gonna speak it into existence because this time next year i want to be talking to you about how we were just in sports illustrated Yes. I've been obsessed with the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition since uh, I was like six years old. Yeah. Like, and I love what they're doing right now. Like, I, I think it's really cool. I'm such a fan. And I'm also like, I'm, this is kind of unrelated, but I'm a giant WNBA fan. And they had the like four or five players from the WNBA on one of the covers last year. It was so awesome. Yeah. Like, I love what they're doing too. And I cannot wait to get FYI in Sports Illustrated. It'll so happen. let's speak that into existence. If anyone knows anyone at Sports Illustrated, they need my Hook bikinis. Us up. Yeah. I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> yes. That would yes. be so dope. It would be amazing. We'll shoot it here in Miami. You don't even have to budget for us to go anywhere. <laughs> but I mean, you can if you want. But yeah, I mean, if you want us to send, send us to the Caribbean, we'll go. We will. <laughs> Yeah, I actually really liked the shoot that they did um, for Kim's swim line. She had that like chrome collection or whatever. Oh, the skim and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, they did a really cool campaign shoot for her. It was all film. It was neat. They um, are doing some cool stuff. I have a friend who's doing um, technical design over there right now. They are doing some really cool stuff. Yeah. 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 I like to see photographers in like the commercial realm using film and doing kind of weird stuff because that shoot was really weird that yeah. they did for her and I think was that the was, one with the aliens and stuff yeah there was that one but then they also had her like out in the middle of this like kind of lagoon or whatever and I don't know, it just it was really cool I I think it was a weird move to use film on something like that yeah. and the the creativity behind it is good to see it's I love that though when we when Savage first started we were doing weird stuff too I feel like we kind of got made to move away from that for like you know to become a little bit more mass market. Yeah. But in the beginning, we were working with some creative directors that were doing some wild stuff. One of our first like big campaign shoots was in like a, an abandoned office building that was very like, very seventies, like curvy, brutalist, like, you know, those curved cement yes. walls everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, it was lit kind of like an eerie movie. It felt like, you know, an eighties horror movie or something. And, and the the models were dressed like like had like you know pumps and glasses on like they were all corporate but they were wearing their lingerie and it was really sexy and really weird and um I really liked when we were being weird but you know not everybody likes weird and as yeah. as things evolve into three billion dollar businesses they gotta shake the weird a little bit so I'm excited know. to get weird again yeah I was like I don't know I kind of like the weird I feel like when brands are doing weird things that's when they're standing out so I agree I think embrace the weird that's that's me personally I agree yeah yeah but you know so Sports Illustrated it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's gonna happen because I have loved that issue of that magazine since I was a little kid and it's like my most 
formative gay memory. I always tell people that like, <laughs> why didn't you know I was gay? Because I was definitely <laughs> stealing and stashing Sports Illustrated issues when I was like a little kid, like, like <laughs> hiding them, like, like looking at it being like, oh my God, she's so pretty. Yeah. Like <laughs> for me, we were laughing one day. We were all like talking about like cartoon characters that were also like gay awakenings. And mine was definitely Kim Possible. Oh yeah. It was yeah. just like, I was in love with That's her. That's a popular one. Yeah. yeah. It's an easy one. It's an As easy As a redhead, go. I can definitely see one. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, she's hot. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> me being nine looking mine, at Kim Mine was big time Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. I have three brothers and, and my dad, so they would get it. And yeah. I was like, what you looking at? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like father-daughter bonding. Oh, yeah. Over. Yeah. They Sports would, uh, when I started doing lingerie design, one of my first big press pieces, was I, I designed a Kiki de Montparnasse before I started my own line. And um, one of the bras I designed was on the cover of Maxim magazine on an actress that my brothers and dad really liked. And I brought home. Can like, you name the actress? <laughs> to be really honest, I don't remember, I remember her name. Either. She was a television actress and I don't really watch TV at the time. Yeah. I hadn't owned a TV in like 10 years. So I didn't. Colby was her first name. She's on a TV show. I don't know what her name is. I don't remember, but she was hot. She was on the cover of Maxim and she looked great in that bra. And so I brought home issues for my brothers and my dad and my That's boy funny. cousins for uh for Christmas. And they were like with the stocking stuff for and they were really stoked. They're all making me sign it and stuff. Cute. It was really cute. Aw. So your parents like are really supportive of what you're doing. And so supportive. They, you know, when I was a kid, oh, this is funny. I, I'm glad you asked me that. When I was a kid, um, I told my parents I was going to be a fashion designer when I was 10. And Aww. my dad is a surgeon and my mom's a like pediatric head trauma nurse. So they were very, very smart scientific people. And right. they were like, what do you mean you want to be a fashion designer? Like they were genuinely confused. Um, they definitely had wanted me to go into medicine. Um, my dad was like really annoyed that I wanted to do something creative, but eventually I think they understood that like it was something I was just crazy passionate about. And that summer I spent the entire summer making like a fully illustrated catalog that mm -hmm. I made up. Like I would draw an outfit in like multiple colorways and then write the whole copy for it. Like item A comes in this colorway Aww. and is this price and like wrote everything like it was real. Um, and my mom still has that. And they were like, okay, we kind of know you're serious about this. I taught myself how to sew on my grandma's sewing machine, even though my grandma didn't know how to sew. Aww. And then um, I started working at Joanne Fabrics when I was like 14 or 15 years old so that I could Perfect. afford the fabric. <laughs> And uh, I started making all my own, like making everything. And I started doing fashion shows when I was 14. And my first fashion show was at a nightclub in downtown Indianapolis where you had to be 21 to enter. So my parents had to enter with me and take oh. me as soon as my runway show was done because it was not allowed to be in there. Yeah. And I did a model casting at the Marriott Hotel downtown in Indianapolis. And I was 14 years old and I cast all, all adult women. Like, can you imagine being an adult woman going into a model casting That's and a 14 so year old cute. sitting there being like, mm, okay, looks like you're in. Like, yeah. what the heck? Who, who gave me the right? Like, I don't know <laughs> what I was thinking, but I was a very ambitious child. Um, and so I started making really sexy dresses for adult women when I was like 14 and doing runway shows producing full-blown runway shows so That's so cool um and then I did them like probably every year after that yeah and it was it was really fun I would make like you know I would make prom dresses for girls in my school and stuff so I was like had a little fashion hustle ever since I was a That's kid amazing um and like I said I launched FYI in like 2011 after working at Kiki de Montparnasse for a few years mm -hmm. um and it's a I don't know if you're familiar with that brand but it's like a really really luxury um sex shop They've, mm -hmm. There's like three of them. They make lingerie, but it's all silk and made in New York. And it's very, very exclusive and expensive. Like the bras are like three to four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's in that like La Perla range of, of price point. Right. Um, and so I had worked there for a few years, but, you know, it's a really small company. So they didn't produce a lot of stuff, like maybe a few looks a year. And I just had so many ideas. And I asked them if I could make some of my ideas for my own thing. And they gave me permission um, because, you know, normally with stuff like that, there's like a conflict of oh, interest. Yeah. But I had permission to do like my own collection. And mm -hmm. I, I showed it in Brooklyn Fashion Week and the rest is history. FYI just became its own thing. So cool. 
That's great that your family is supportive of that too. And supportive of like your relationship and your life and everything I'm assuming as well. Very much. They love my, they love my wife. They, uh, they probably like her more than me now. (laughs) (laughs) Like traded you out. (laughs) Right. Exactly. No, they love it. Um, they, they've always been very supportive of who I am. And I'm really lucky because I grew up in a very rural place where that is not yeah, the case for most people. Yeah, I was going to say from Indiana, like, good for, good, literally good for you. Yeah. Like, that's, a, I'm that's lucky. a great backing to have. And that's really important for your psyche and as a creative to have that as well. So it's it's nice to see. And I can't wait to interview your wife. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for I you I didn't to know that either. you guys were so, like, multifaceted. I come in here, I see paintings on the wall of yours. You guys have a whole music studio. It's just so cool. Yeah, we are uh, we are all around creatives. And like I said, that's, I told you earlier, that's how we met. We met volunteering at Rock Camp, teaching girls music. She was a, a DJ instructor, and I was a bass instructor. So cute. And I asked her band to open up for my band because I had a big crush on her. So uh, we were both like touring bass players at the time. Like, so we were like in punk bands in Brooklyn. And, um, but we'd always both done other things. Yeah. Like art, all kinds of music, art. Um, you know, I'm a dancer. Um, I've always been a fashion designer. So I, we like to make lots of different kinds of things. And that's always like my number one piece of advice to younger designers is, stay creative outside of work yeah. because you will burn out and you will run out of ideas and you will get extremely frustrated yep. if you aren't being, if you, if your job is your only creative outlet, because there's so many limitations there. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time, I'm like, cause they're like, Oh, what do you like to photograph the most? I'm like, well, this is what I do for money. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I photograph for money. Yeah. This is what I photograph for myself. You know? And they're like, well, what if you tried to make that profitable? I'm like, that's not what that's for though. Right. That's just for me. That's for my little brain. You know, yeah. but this is what makes me money. So those two things are going to probably remain separate. So. Exactly. I mean, for literally the last eight years, people have been like, why don't you do your own brand still? Why don't you do your own brand still? And I was just like, well, it's hard. It's a lot of work to run your own business. Yeah. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, I wouldn't go back. It's it's so rewarding and it is it is a struggle. But um, I think at least for me, the uh, benefits are outweighing the uh, the risks and the, the downsides. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. As yeah. a business Maybe owner. not even <laughs> Well, we just started. So financially, that definitely isn't the case. But um you know, I feel very fulfilled doing what I'm doing and I'm proud Good. of the work that I'm doing because of the way it's being made and because of, you know, how inclusive the sizing is. And I, I feel good about this product and I really believe in it. So yeah. I feel like I'm ready to stick to my guns on this project, even though yeah. it's a little scary to start my own business. No, again. stick to it. I, I think it will literally it's like one of those things like where you throw a bunch of spaghetti to the wall and what sticks like it's one right. of those things. I, I think that you're going to be very successful. I think you're in the perfect place to do it. You know, like if you were still in Indiana trying to do the swimwear brand, I'd be like, yeah, it's mm. <laughs> really going to I don't know if that's going to go over well. But you're in Miami. Like everybody is always in swimsuits, like you said. So I think this is a good place for you to be. It's going to it's going to go well. And I love Miami. It's yeah. like truly my home. Um, you know, I didn't grow up here, but my wife and I moved here. We met in New York, but we moved in together here and we got yeah. married here. And this is truly our home, like the yeah. home that we've made together. My family, you know, my immediate yeah. family that I've started. This is pups. our home. Yeah. <laughs> me, my wife and the pups. Um, Miami is truly our home. And, and we said that the whole time we lived in California, people were like, oh, are you from LA? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're from Miami. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this city feels like home to me and I'm very proud of it. And I know there's a lot of problematic things going on with mm-hmm. our government, but um, I want so badly for us to stay and fight, you know, even yeah. I understand that for some people, they need their health care and they need their safety and they've got to do what they've got to do to protect themselves. And I fully support that. But as many of us as as can, yeah. I, I think we really got to stay and fight because Florida I, is so beautiful yeah, and so I special. I just was having that conversation with somebody. I was like, it kind of like I would never judge anybody for leaving for their own safety or for their health care. But at the same time, it's like you're kind of letting them win. You know, like, of course, that's what they want. They want everyone. They want to chase us out of here. They want all the queers out of here. They want to chase us out. We're letting them win. And yeah, some of us got to protect our safety more than others. You know, I'm lucky enough. I'm 
high femme. I'm very straight passing. I don't like that, but it does afford me a lot of privilege safety wise. And um, so, you know, I think about the real I, I see and experience the realities that my trans friends and non-binary friends are experiencing right yeah. now. And even my wife, who's a uh, cis, but like not very bush presenting. Mm -hmm. So well, I think a lot of people mistake her for a trans person, yeah. um, especially in Florida where mm -hmm. people are witch hunting for trans yeah. people, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we got to stay and fight for our community because this is a really beautiful place and we belong here. And I, like we talked about earlier, we have met some of the most amazing people. I've traveled all over the world and I've met lots of kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, I think Miami is truly the most beautiful place in the world. And the people are my favorite. And yeah. I like really, really mean that. And I think that Florida gets a bad rap, but like, don't throw it away. Like yeah. it's really, really beautiful, special place. And we got to fight for it. Like it's ours too. Yeah. I, I think the queer community is going to be just fine here. I think it's just going to take a little bit longer, unfortunately, and we'll see what the government does in the next couple years, I would say. I think the direct impact is going to be the next couple years. Yeah. But yeah, no, can't let them win. You can't. We're no. here. We own businesses. Right. Like we are, we are Miami. Yeah. And <laughs> so. honestly, that's part of the reason that like that just makes me want to be here more. Yeah. Like I want to dig oh, my feet yeah. in and I'm protect like, this place. I live people. out of spite. Like the second yeah. <laughs> anybody says that I can't do something, I'm just like, that's fuel. Watch me. Yeah. <laughs> fuel to my ass about it. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to put it in overdrive now. Like now I'm really going to do it. Right. You know? <laughs> For real. No better fuel than someone telling you that you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note. I feel like that was a great conversation. Yeah, it was. Thank you so much. This yeah. was lovely. And yeah, I, no. I wasn't nervous after all. Good. See, it's not that scary. <laughs> not that scary. No, I'm super glad we were able to coordinate times so quickly. Too. Yeah, like, we I, made this happen fast. Yeah, yeah. I reached out to you like two days ago, I feel like, and did it. So Yeah. Well, well, it's it's production wise, it's a really good time. We yeah. just had swim week and I'm waiting on a bunch of all the little components, the tags and yeah. things like that to come together for them to finish production. So I've got a little time on my hands right now. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm so excited to see what you do this next year. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited for us to hopefully work together. Yeah. And I'm really glad to meet another uh, female photographer yeah. here because... We're kind of far and few between. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but... Yeah, no, I'm super excited um, about this conversation and seeing where you go and what you do and excited to see that Sports Illustrated cover. Yes. <laughs> we we, we, we spoke that. it into existence today. I, I feel it. Yeah. It's the full moon and we're both Pisces. So obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. It just happened. Yeah. We need to go like jump in the ocean after this. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> in your cute swimsuits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In some micro -kini. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my little outro. Well, I always ask people what you're listening to right now. It's your most your most listened to song or what do you work to what do you play the most oh my gosh <laughs> that's a good question put you on the spot that is a good question to put me on the spot um well I think probably because of where my mind's been creatively with like the old Italiana kind yeah. of stuff I've been listening to a lot of like 60s exotica which Cute. that's what the genre is called but I'm like artists like Esquival and Les Baxter and like Nino Rota Nino Rota and like you know just like um that kind of like quirky funky boppy like yeah. music that they play in 60s and 70s movies like I'm just that's where I'm at right now like like fully immersed in that uh that like aesthetic and 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 the audio as well of that cool. uh, whole vibe so nice. definitely like my Esquival stuff right now cha 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 awesome <laughs> <laughs> I love that everybody's answer is always completely different so I'm always curious um, but yeah. All right, you guys. Well, this has been the Little Art Studio Podcast. Once again, my name is Ashley McKibben. This is Danny Reed, and I'll make sure to link her everywhere, social media, website, because by then you should have your website up. So yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. We'll catch you on the next one. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs>